Thanks. So, um, so I'm here. I wanted to. Uh, I, I had the benefit of kind of a last mover advantage on on these talks, and uh, I, I saw all of the other talks have been submitted, and there was a lot of really interesting, high level kind of thought about uh, uh, about game design. So I thought it might be good for a session to kind of get a little bit down into the weeds um, and look at some real details of different things. Um, this is also an offshoot of a, a project that I'm working on with uh, Isaac Shalev um, to try to put together some nomenclature and to try to kind of categorize and classify uh, different mechanics in a, in a more organized form. So, uh, so I'm curious your feedback if this type of format is helpful for everybody. So first, um, let's talk about how to use the clicker. There we go. <laughs> uh, so what is the point of an auction? Why do we want to include auctions in games? What do they bring to a game? Um, and the simplest answer is that they allow or force, depending on your perspective, the players to determine the value of objects. Um, in a game like you know, Dominion or Monopoly or whatever, there's, there's, there's a certain value that's printed on cards or on properties, and that's what you have to pay, and that's the value that everything is measured off of. Um, by introducing an auction, uh, it takes that off the table. So the players can determine it, which gives flexibility in terms of if the price of things is varying, something's more valuable at the beginning of the game or the end of the game, or vice versa. It allows the players to uh, you know, have a fluctuating scale in how that goes. Um, but in order for forcing the players to determine the value, that means that the value can't be obvious. Um, for example, I was going to bring a $10 bill, but I have a $1 bill. I mean, how much would, you know, if you're going to auction off a $10 bill, how, how much are people going to bid? You know, maybe you'll get up to $9, and then maybe somebody doesn't want to go to 10 but maybe they don't want to give somebody, but, you know, a $10 bill is going to go for $10. So if the value of what you're auctioning off is super obvious, then your auction mechanic is not going to work. So what are some of the ways that you can obfuscate the value? What are some of the techniques that designers use? First, um, there can just be hidden elements of the lot. There's some games where there's some items face up and some items face down, and you don't know everything that you're getting. You're only getting a, a certain portion of it that you can see. Uh, another possibility is hidden goals. For certain players, things may have certain, certain values, and so you have to kind of judge what it may be worth to, to different players. Um, okay, that's a different one, sorry. Uh, the other one, which is probably the one that's most used, is that the value is dependent on some future events or future things that are happening. Um, a classic example of that is in set collection. If you're trying to collect a certain number of red cards, if the game is structured in a certain way, you may not know how many red cards are going to come up or, or how they're going to be bundled with other things at certain lots. So you are making an assumption, okay, if I get this, then this is what the value is going to be. Um, but you have to wait for the future events to actually determine that value, whether it's what comes up or the order in which it comes up. Uh, so uh, that, that is another method. Um, or hidden resources, which is the resources that players have to bid with. If you don't know what people have to bid with, maybe the value is the same, but uh, you know, people know the value, but you may want to try to, if you think that people have fewer resources than they actually have, that's some, another way that you can make the bidding a little bit more interesting and, and obfuscate things. So, why are auctions good? Why do people like including them in games? Um, first is player agency. You give the players a, a, a definite decision that they need to make and a series of decisions in rapid fire oftentimes of what they need to do. So it's a good way to get the players engaged. Um, it creates a lot of interaction between the players. You've got to look the other person in the eye and try to figure out, you know, how high are they going to go? Can I intimidate them? What are they going to do? Um, especially with some of the different type of sealed big auctions and things that we'll talk about a little bit later. So it immediately creates an interaction point for all of the players. Um, it can create drama and excitement. It can create those tense moments in a game where somebody's not sure, do I want to go one dollar more, do I want to go a little bit more, um, or, uh, and, and other ways to introduce surprises into the, uh, into the auction process. And it can help players feed into a strategy. Um, it can, you know, if, if something is, is very going to be very valuable to you, um, it, you know, you can shift your strategy. If you know that other people are pursuing lots of things, you can kind of take the path not taken and certain auction goods may be better for you, easier for you to get than others. So it allows you to define a strategy and an approach. Um, it also helps players that are good at calculation. Um, and some, you know, some people think that's a negative thing. I probably should have included on both the good and the bad list, which is coming up, but you know, certainly for players that are good 
at looking at it and mathematically calculating what's the expectation, what are things that come in, what, what's this, the value of this truly based on some future events, that's a skill that you can play into and, and appeal to that type of player. So why are auctions bad? Um, and there are a number of them. Um, first is they can be very time consuming, depending on the type of the auction. And the bulk of this talk is going to be on breaking down individual types of auctions. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But a typical open auction of going around a table can take, you know, one to two minutes, which doesn't sound like a lot. But if you're going to do, you know, 20 or 30 auctions in your game, that can be a big portion of your time budget. Um, just as an aside, one of the one of the exercises I do with my students a lot when I'm teaching is 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 when they come up with initial concepts of the game is try to think about how long do you want your game to be, and what does that imply in terms of the number of turns that it can be, the number of rounds that it can be. Uh, I call it the time budget, and make them go through. I've had some people come to me even with prototype games, and they come and they're like, "Oh yeah, this is like a sixty minute game," and they lay out, and it's you know it's forty five turns and. You know, each person does this, and it's like, there, you know, this is a four-hour game. You, you know, you got to sit down and look at that. Um, and that can be an important way to do it. And auctions, depending on the design of them, will, can eat up that budget pretty quickly. Um, a big one is also for first-time players. If this is the first time that I'm playing a game, and one of the first things that I'm hit with is an auction, that can be a big challenge for me as a player. Um, in the 18xx games, um, a lot of them, 1830 I know if, if for certain, starts off with an auction of the private company auction. Um, and there's usually a little bit of a starting value which gives you a clue, but they all have special powers and they give you special powers and special starting locations for the early part of the game. Well, if I'm a first time player, I, I don't know what that is worth. I have no basis for understanding what that really means. Um, and uh, a lot of games... Also, some games will start with an auction for to see who gets to go first. And some games that can be incredibly powerful. And, you know, people are bidding $1 or $2 to do it, and they should be bidding 10 or 11 So that can be a problem. So as a designer, if you're going to do that, and let's say you absolutely shouldn't do an early auction, but you need to give the players some kind of a clue as to what the valuation is. Either suggested values in the rule book. I've seen that in a couple of games where they'll say, you know, it you should be players should be bidding around maybe five or six dollars. This is worth something like that, or by actually printing values on things as as a suggested value um, that gives them a context of what to do. Another is um, that they can be repetitive. If your whole game is auctions, time after time after time after time, that can start to get a repetitive feel. There's ways around that, and if the things that are being bid for uh, change and vary and become more powerful and fit into people's plans in different ways, it can work fine, um, but just something that you need to be aware of. Okay, so let's talk about some of these mechanisms in more detail. So first is an open auction. Um, and this is what a lot of people kind of think about, except maybe English also of uh, the type of auction. And this is just where people can just shout out whatever they want. And then, you know, there's no structure. It's uh, just, just people shouting. And when the person says the highest number and nobody else wants to go higher, uh, then that person is the winner. Um, so uh, there's typically no true auctioneer in this one, um, or the auctioneer may bid on occasion. Um, but as you can guess, you know, just because it's no structure, it can be chaotic. There can be issues of who said the bid first, um, and, and all those types of things that need to be dealt with. It is very infrequently used in games. Um, there's a couple that it's in, uh, Monopoly to a certain extent, or you know, I'll talk about in Modern Art, also has an, an open auction, um, although with a, a little bit of an auctioneer, the, the player who puts it up. Um, but it is not used that much. So, actually, how many people here have played Monopoly? Show of hands. How many people here have played Monopoly with the auction rule? Oh, way more than I thought. Okay, so I was really curious. I went back, and this is actually the auction rule from Monopoly. Um, so it says, I'll just do the second paragraph. It says, if you do not wish to buy the property, the banker sells it at auction to the highest bidder. That's all it says. It gives absolutely no indication of how to conduct that auction, uh, which I thought was really, really interesting. Um, so, you know, so I threw it into this open auction category because theoretically everyone could just shout the bid that they want. Um, okay. Oh, bid may start at any price. It does say that. So that's about it. Okay, next up is the English auction. Okay, an English auction is very similar to an open auction, except it has an auctioneer that does not participate in the auction. 
Um, in this case, they get a gavel. Um, so no specific order. People just shout, but they're recognized by the auctioneer. So you get a little bit of a, of a structure to it. Um, they can, the auctioneer is in charge of resolving precedence issues, talking it up, try, you know, could even maybe decide increments that they want. Um, there's different things to do. Um, one of the things with this type of an auction, and if you're doing it in a traditional auction style where the auctioneer is like raising the bid, you know, we have five, do I hear seven, do I hear seven, do I hear nine, whatever. Um, if you're doing it with paddles or raised hands or something like that, rather than people shouting auctions, uh, just shouting prices, you start to get some of the gamesmanship can start to come into it. Okay, people can you start using body language to start to signal their intent in the auction. You know, if you put your paddle up and the price keeps going up and you just keep it up there and you don't do anything, uh, that's sending a signal to the other players. Um, again, it's not something in the rules, it's not something, it's but just body language intent, like, you're not chasing me out of this, which could be good or could be bad, depending on what the other players are doing, but um, it starts to add some interesting, yeah, just a quick pull down, <laughs> leave somebody else standing. Um, a lot of games that do this, uh, and there aren't actually that many, but uh, oftentimes the winning bid will go to the auctioneer um, as a way of sort of the money flowing through the system, so it gives them an incentive to try to talk it up and to, to get the price as high as possible. Um, I was actually having some difficulty coming up with, with games for this list because uh, most of the games I knew that kind of did this, the auctioneer could bid on it. Um, but um, the mine reverse Pokemon. Yeah, to, yeah, the mine certainly, it certainly has that body language. Right? If I get that hundred in my hand, you know, I'm just leaning it back. <laughs> <laughs> I do the lean back, cards down, arms folded, 100 look. <laughs> So yeah, the mind kind of comes into that to a certain extent. But there are a couple of games that do this on a, a very strict English auction rules basis. Uh, Container is one, the logistics game, and you're bluffing. Um, so I did crowdsource this on Twitter, so thanks to those of you that responded with examples of this type of game. So yeah. Um, well, that's a little bit different because people sort of... It's sort of you set the price, uh, correct me, you, you set the price on that and people either kind of buy it at that price or, or don't buy it at that price. So that's a little bit of a different thing. I stayed away from price setting games. That's sort of a different category. Um, okay, next one, and this is probably the most popular and commonly used type of auction, is turn order until pass. Um, in this case, you can see the person on top started four and then it just goes around in a circle till everybody but one person passes and that's the winner of the auction. Um, the advantages of this are um, that it's, it's very, very organized. You know, you don't have to worry about people shouting and deciding who said something first. Um, it does uh, uh, also gives you the option for signaling, um, both by body language and by your bid, okay? If, I, if somebody bids five and I jump to nine, Okay, that's, that's a strong signal. You know, if I go to six, that's something else. So you have opportunities in there for starting to signal to other players and creating a little bit of social interaction. Um, there can be issues with turn order. Um, if there is a, and this has to do with obfuscation. Okay, so this, this controls the order in which players are going to get to bid. So if you really think, in this case, if you think that the value of the thing is eight and you that's what you want to bid, right, if it... In, in just an open English auction, you can just jump out and shout eight or seven or whatever what you think you're going to do. But in this case, you might not even have that opportunity or somebody else may have the opportunity to bid eight. If everyone else decides it's eight, somebody will just jump to that and stick to it. And you're kind of stuck if you're not early in the turn order. Um, so uh, the obfuscation in particular is important with this. Um, typically in these types of auctions, there is no re-entry once you pass your out. Um, there, I have seen some games where they do have that, where you can pass and come back in, um, which can be an interesting strategy, but, uh, but I, I find that it lengthens the auctions. Um, so in terms of trying to keep the timing down, it's something to keep in mind. Um, some games that have this include Power Grid, um, as, as a typical auction like this. And um, the more obscure game, but still one of my favorites, is Marrakesh, uh, where you're bidding on shops. Um, where somebody picks a shop to put up to try to get other patrons to come visit their shop. Okay. okay. Um, once around. Uh, this is similar to the um, go until pass type, except you only go around one time. Uh, you have a certain first player and a certain last player, and, and that's it. Um, 
the uh, this very very tightly attaches to the turn order. Okay, this is kind of like uh, a poker variant. You know, this is kind of like the Texas Hold'em. That if you're in that last seat, you're in an extremely strong position. Um, so this isn't really used that often. Um, there are some games that have done it. Um, but you have to make sure that turn order is cycling reasonably well and uh, uh, that everyone's going to have an opportunity to be that last player, to kind of to have that hammer to drop it down because they can just go, you know, just one higher. They know exactly where they need to be to get it and everyone else is kind of playing with it. Um, this is actually done in a fair number of games. Uh, Medici does this. Uh, modern Art, also one of their types of auctions in Modern Art is a, uh, is a once around auction. So... Um, it, it's, it's interesting in modern art, for those of you that haven't played it, um, you should leave this talk now and go play it. <laughs> uh, but in case you don't have a copy with you, um, so modern art has a whole series of different auction types. Um, on the, depending on the card, the painting that you play determines the type of auction. Um, and the, uh, you're ultimately you're trying to get the most money. So, it's interesting in that certain auction types, like the once around auction, you can play that. And as the auctioneer, if you're putting it up for bid, you get the last shot at it, if I recall correctly. So that can be a really good way for you to make sure you get that painting to do that type of an auction. But it's not going to maximize your income. The other thing, it's another one of these games. If you don't buy it as the auctioneer, you get that money. Um, so there are other types of auctions that will, may actually result in you gaining more money. Um, and there's a whole series of game theory, well, we could get on that a little bit, of maximizing you know, if you're just auctioning stuff off to try to raise as much money as you can about the type of auction that you want to do. I'll touch on that a little bit, but that's not as important. But this one, the once around, is not going to maximize. It's maximize the chance of the last player getting it, but not the amount of money that they're going to take in. Okay, so re-enter after pass. I touched on that a little bit um, with the, um, uh, when talking about the, um, the, 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 just going around. Um, I'm calling this a meta mechanic because it can be used with a variety of different types of auctions. Um, but uh, it does allow for some interesting game uh, play possibilities of ducking. You'll see this not strictly in auctions, but you'll see this sometimes in action mechanics uh, where a player can have a choice of either taking an action or passing. And when both players pass, that's when the round ends or all the players pass. So sometimes if you want to go later in the round or you want to wait to see what other people do, you can take a chance and kind of lay low and, and, and wait for other people to, you know, make their plans a little bit clearer so that you can jump up and take advantage of that. So this has elements of that, but I find that this type of idea of entering after passing is a little bit more effective in that action scheme rather than an auction scheme. Yeah, if I'm... Right, like on your turn, if you're going to take an action, you, you, maybe you have a menu of three or four actions that you can take on your turn. So you do one or you can pass. And it just keeps going around and people keep taking actions until everybody passes. And a lot of those games, like um, I think Guilds of London maybe does this, you can pass. Um, and if it comes back to you, you can still jump in and do another action if it gets back to you. But if everybody passes before it gets back to you, then you're done. Um, so that's, that's re-enter after pass. Uh, High Frontier does that, um, the Phil Eklund game in that auction um, is, is one example of that. Yeah, you auction off the patents. Yeah. <laughs> what was that? Um, yeah, Great Down, Great Down Moody, well, yeah, because you can if you don't raise it. Yeah, and it comes back around to you, you can raise it again. Yes, yes. It's been too long since I played the Great Town Moody. I need to get that one back on the table. Right. Yes, Tom. Also has the option to um, force people to pass in the three like in Evo or Homestead. Okay. I've played Evo a ton. I'm not, I'm trying to remember how that works. Well, the person who is below someone may have passed earlier, but they have to then go and everyone. Okay. Oh, right, right, right. Yes. Yeah, we're going to get to that type of an auction coming up. Um, yeah, that's that's like a placement auction. Yes. Yeah, there, there's definitely other ways to do that. That's why I call it kind of a meta mechanic, because there's a lot of different types of auctions that can apply to. I, I'm very excited about the interactivity here. This is great. Seriously, please jump in. 
Okay, um, sealed bid um, is the next one here. And so from our little schematic uh, diagram, um, you'll see that everyone secretly decides how much they want to bid, and then it's all revealed at the same time, and the high bidder takes it. Um, there's a lot of advantages to this. It's a very popular technique. Um, but there's a few things you need. Well, it's popular because it's, it's usually pretty fast. Um, unlike keep going around in circles and people raising, uh, if players are pretty much on top of their game and are involved with what's going on, they can do a sealed bid relatively quickly. Um, you do need to include tokens and things like that, so there's a little bit of a, of a component overhead to make sure people make change and have the right thing to put into their fist. Um, but typically, this, this is one of the faster type of actions. Um, you also, on the negative side though, you need to uh, deal with ties. Um, so there has to be some sort of a system of priority of how that works. So whether it's just a player has a priority token, for example, and the person closest to that player is the one who breaks the ties, or, or some other system, um, uh, Rising Sun, for example, there's just like a, a, an honor track, and who's ever higher on the honor track is going to break all the ties. So, but you need to have some type of system to deal with that. Um, it can create bad feelings sometimes, or fun moments, depending on which side of this you're on. When if everyone bids 0, 1, and 2, and then you know Isaac bids 12, um, and then it's all revealed, and, uh, and Isaac feels bad about that, and everybody else laughs at him. So that could be a that could be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on your perspective and the type of game that you're trying to do. Um, and it also starts to introduce, and you'll see this in a lot of the sealed bid ones that we're talking about, of um, and even some of the negative bid ones, of the term yomi. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that term, but yomi is um, a Japanese term which I've been adopting because it's useful in a lot of cases of trying to get inside the mind of somebody else. Trying to, it's the, the princess bride, you know, he can't put the poison in the glass in front of him, he would have put it in the glass in front of me, and just trying to work through other people's thought processes and how that works. So I like that as a nice shorthand word for that feeling. So in sealed bids, this is where it comes to the obfuscation of you want to try to figure out how high is somebody going to go, how many resources do they have to bid, what other things are they trying to do. Um, and, and that can be either a fun thing for some people or a not fun thing, depending on where you're trying to get to with your game. Oh, some examples of that, uh, there are tons of these. Um, game of Thrones does it, Scythe does it. There's, there's a lot of games that use single sealed bid. So this is one you don't see too often, call, I call sealed bid with cancellation. And this is one way of dealing with ties. So the idea here is that if one or more people bid the highest, their bids cancel each other out, and you go to the person that bids the second highest. So in this case, the person at the top of the table and the bottom of the table both bid $9. So their bids cancel out, and so well, they're having more fun over there than we are over here. I feel badly. Uh, so in this case, the person that bid two dollars is going to be the winner. Um, and again, this emphasizes those fun moments or negative moments, depending on your perspective, um, and it can dramatically increase Yomi. Um, this is typically used with games that have a limited subset of bids that people can make. Um, the two biggest examples of this um, was originally in this game called Holstegeier. I'm probably mispronouncing that, so I'll just say Raj, which was the English reprint. Um, and Skyrunner, which is a real nifty physical game. I should have included a picture of that. Um, but in Raj, everyone has um, bidding tiles or bidding cards that range from 1 to 15. I believe they're tiles. Um, so 1 to 15, and you can use each one once during the game. And then a card comes up with a number on it that also, I think, range from 1 to 15. And so if the 14 comes up, you get to decide which number tile you're picking. And if the two people at number one pick the same tile, bidding tile, they cancel out and they lose those tiles for the rest of the game. Every tile it, you, it goes away for the rest of the game. That's the whole game. And you're trying, whoever collects the highest point value of cards wins the game. Um, so it really adds that element of, uh, it's the 15, but probably everyone's going to bid their highest one on this. But then maybe everyone's going to think that, so no one's going to do it, so maybe I should do it to squeak in. So that's that. Um, Skyrunner, for those that don't know, it was a, a Ravensburger game from probably the late 90s, um, which I love games that take stuff in the box and you do something physical with them. You actually build this gigantic tower with it. It's like a three-level tower. It ends up being about this tall, and it's got these peg holes along the side, and you're actually climbing up the building. And the auction mechanic is used for equipment and movement cards, so it lays out a tableau of movement cards and you lay out your, your bids to try to get it, and the highest bidder gets first choice, 
if two people cancel each other out or more cancel each other out, they get moved to the bottom and they get to pick last instead of picking first. Um, so if you haven't a chance to see Skyrunner, it's got tremendous table presence. I don't believe it's still in print. It's not in print. Scott, okay. Scott is shaking his head no. <laughs> yeah. Come to my house, I have a copy. <laughs> okay, constrained bid. I alluded to this a little bit. So the idea with a constrained bid is rather than just being able to say any number, um, you have a limited set of tiles or, or limited amounts that you're allowed to bid or raise bids in. Um, in a sense, every auction is sort of a constrained bid because it's usually in you know integer increments, but this is usually when there's many fewer. Um, so um, there's kind of a couple of different variations of this. Um, just spoil here. The, the two main games, and again, going Knizia on this, are Ra. In Ra, the players have bidding tiles. And I believe each player gets three bidding tiles that they can use, and that's what you can bid. Um, so then the tiles cycle through the, the game, and if you lose a bid, you, you can get some of the other tiles. Uh, so, um, as, so you have to look at what the other people have and think about, you know, where do your tiles fit? Um, in high society, you start with a hand of money cards that range in increment from $1 up to 25 and when you place a bid, it's, it's a continue until pass auction. It keeps going around and around in a circle. But you have to play one or more of those cards to represent your bid. And if the bid gets back to you, you have to leave the cards that you played from your previous bid on the table, and you have to simply add to that. You're not allowed to take cards up from the table to make change. So that actually makes like your one and your two and your four extremely valuable for being able to just slightly increment a bid. And once you use one of those cards, it's gone for the rest of the game if you win when you win a bid. Um, so that adds a, more strategy to not just what's the value of what I'm bidding on, but what is the value of what I am using to bid on that object. Um, so I, I really love systems that do that and constrain it. Um, in, some, in certain situations, also it can kind of reduce analysis paralysis because you're, you're, you, you have maybe three choices of what you can bid. So you're either going to play the 15 or you're not. That's, that's your choice. Okay, a Dutch auction. Um, a true Dutch auction is um, where something starts at a high value. All the auctions we've talked about for the most part, the, the once around all the once around auction and the multiple round auctions, is they start from a low value and they increase until people can't take the pain anymore and then they drop out. Dutch auction is the reverse. Dutch auction starts at a high value and then gradually goes down until somebody jumps in and says, okay, I'll take it at that price. And the first person to take it at that price gets it. Um, the only game that I'm aware of that's really a true Dutch auction in the classic sense where it's just somebody's calling it and it's going down uh, is uh, Merchants of Amsterdam, which I included this picture up here of this spiffy little clock that it comes with. So that's a wind-up clock. and um, it starts at whatever it starts at. You guys can see it. it starts at like 200, and then it goes down, uh, tick, 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 until somebody slaps it and freezes it at that value, and that's what they pay for the lot. Um, th it's a great component that doesn't last more than like two games. Because <laughs> <laughs> people are smacking it. Um, but it does a lot to the game, okay? It's, you know, one thing that auctions typically don't have really is a lot of tension. They have a certain amount of tension. Is, is somebody going to raise the bid or not raise the bid? But this is much, much more tension. When everyone's sitting around staring at this thing, you can start to faint for it, try to get somebody else to slap it in front of you or whatever. Um, but these types of auctions where it starts high and goes low because everybody's engaged the whole time. If you're counting up, if I pass in my auction, now maybe it's just two people. I don't care anymore what's going on. It's just two other people. I can check out. You can't really check out here. Um, so there's a couple of different types of this. And um, the true form, as I said, is done with a countdown clock. But it is it has a certain polymorphism to uh, market rows, um, things like Through the Ages, where cards at the beginning of the track cost a lot, and they gradually come down. I did that in Expanse. Um, also, even you could say that games like Puerto Rico include this, where there's certain things and people want to select them, but if, if people don't pick it, then the cost of it goes down. You basically get another benefit as it goes. So as time goes on, it's a little bit of a game of chicken. How long am I going to wait until I'm going to jump on and take it? When is the, the value of it reach a level that I will take it? 
Um, so if you look at it through that lens, um, outside merchants of Amsterdam, which is kind of the purest expression of this mechanism, um, you have, you know, Pax Porfiriana, you've got Suburbia, you know, you've got Through the Ages, you've got a ton of different games that have this idea of things that start uh, at a certain value and then go down, even Small World. Um, you skip over certain, you know, certain combinations become cheaper in essence as the game goes on. It does introduce a turn effect. Um, you know, if a card hits a certain, if, you know, if you decide the value of this is two, you know, if when it hits two, it's not your turn, then you're kind of stuck. If somebody, if everyone agrees, so that's why some obfuscation is important for that kind of a market mechanism. Also, and usually it's done in these by having different things be of different value to different players. Okay, um, next up is the second highest auction. Um, and the idea here is we talked in, this is typically used with a sealed bid. We talked in sealed bids um, about the idea of one player um, bidding a, a bunch more than everybody else and feeling bad about it. Um, the way a second highest auction is, is the person who bids the most wins, in this case the person at the bottom there who bid the $9, with a happy face, but you only have to pay the amount that was bid by the second highest player. Um, this actually has an official name. It's called a, uh, a Vickery auction. Um, but it's, um, it could be a meta mechanic. I mean, you could use it with a once around, you know, or, or you know, not once around, but just a, a keep going around until pass auction. And then when everybody passes, you pay what the second highest bid was. You could do that. But it is typically, uh, I think, makes the most sense with sealed bids. It does eliminate that overpay feeling. Um, and I should have looked it up, but I know there's been studies also in terms of the value of what a victory auction does. Yes, Tom, I was going to actually call on you, Tom, to, to elucidate this point. All right. Um, so second price still bid options can be used to stimulate the market by allocating market share to the streaming at home, I will repeat that. So yeah, so Tom, Tom Lehman, uh, for those of you that can't see him, uh, was, uh, was saying that that's actually, it's a very commonly used au auction in economics and the Federal Reserve uses it actually to set monetary value because nobody really has an incentive to bid more than or less than what they really think it's worth. Um, because if you bid, there's no reason to bid less than you think it's worth because there's a chance that somebody may bid what you think it's worth and they're going to get it and you're not and they're going to pay what you said. Um, and, and similarly for bidding over what you want. So it really helps set the price. Um, I, I, so everyone kind of bids more confidently. There's, it takes away perhaps some of the gamesmanship. There's actually very few uses of this in board games that we were able to track down. Um, there is a game called Das Let's Paradise, which I'm also probably mispronouncing from the original German, that does that, which I think is also a Knizia game. Um, he loves his auctions. Uh, but... Um, uh, but that's an opportunity, I think, that's out there for people to use that. Uh, and it's, it's pretty easy to explain. You know, it's not a complicated concept to explain to people how much they're going to get. Um, our, uh, I was recently involved in a charity fundraising event that was trying to raise money by, by doing sealed bids for, for parking spots at the event. And uh, I was really pushing for them to do it as a second highest auction. And they ended up not doing it and because it was like three parking spots that they were auctioning off. And there was no advantage to being the highest versus, you know, third highest. So I said, why don't we just do it as like second highest or third highest or something like that. And um, the first, first person, the person that won the auction bid 1200 and the person that was in like for the second spot was like 400. And so the, the people that bid the 1200, I don't, we didn't publicize the results, <laughs> but I'm sure that they weren't as happy in the end. Yes, Tom. Right. The general property of auction is how much, who are you maximizing? Right. And that's why the auctioneers are often incentives of the final price, so that their incentives along with the sellers incentives get as much money as possible from the market. Right. Yeah. So again, um, to do that on Mike, so the, the idea is that there, there there are certain types of auctions that are going to maximize things for the 
the sellers and certain types of auctions that may you know have a more fair mid range price. So this is this is of the latter type. Okay, um, so this next type is what uh, I'm calling a selection order bid. So the idea here is that there are multiple things that are available to be purchased, and everyone is simultaneously bidding for them. It could be a sealed bid, or it could be um, you know just around the table bid. But the result of the bid is the is the order in which you get to select the lot that you want. Um, so in this case here, we've got lots A through D, and people bid, and so the $9 bid is going to get first choice of what they want to do, and the $1 bid will be left with what's left over at the end. Um, so the advantage, just a couple of, of technical things with this. First, um, if the value of the lots is very specifically known, um, then if it's going on around the table auction, people can just pick them up as it goes around, like for sale does that. Okay, so as you're bidding on um, the houses, um, they're just in numerical order. So if you decide to be the first one to drop out of the bid, um, you get first choice and it, it's always the lowest value and so on. Um, if the value it can be different to different players, then you're going to have to some way of keeping track of the order of what it is. Um, it can be a really interesting mechanic because this goes back to what we talked about all the way at the beginning of, of value to different players. If you're treading the path not taken, there may be a lot there that is very valuable for you, but is not valuable for the other players at all because they're not pursuing that strategy. And so then you can start to play the Yomi game and, you know, maybe low bid, figuring that that one's going to be left over at the end anyway, and all the other, other players are going to be dogfighting over the, the more expensive ones. Um, there are a couple of variants of this. Um, the, uh, uh, you can do it so that the early bidder, the people that drop out earlier, don't have to pay their full bid. Uh, Age of Steam does that. Um, when in Age of Steam, there's an auction for both turn order and rolls, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, and I think the second highest bidder gets half their bid back, and only the the top bidder pays their full bid. Um, and this also, you know, if it, it whereas like in the Game of Thrones board game, you actually have three separate auctions to auction off the special rolls, the the Raven and the Sword and the Crown. I think it is. Uh, this is a way to basically have one auction and auction off four things in one auction, so it can save time that way. So on the last one, like if you know you want the, the lowest value for the lot, yeah. you could just say, like, I'm not bidding. You could bid zero, or you amount. could, right, exactly, yep. It's, yeah, it can be a great feeling, be a great thing to do, but you're taking a bit of a chance. Uh, so for sale does this, as I said, Age of Steam Libertalia also does this, although it's also wrapped up in the special powers, but basically the number that you play is sort of your bid in the order in which you're going to take the treasure. Okay, so this is multiple lots, multiple players, um, which is a, a similar but, but different use case. Um, in this case, you are bidding, there are multiple lots on the table, but you are bidding separately for each of the lots simultaneously. Um, typically, this is physically done with some sort of a screen, and you play on a mat behind a screen. Um, so one person could win more than one lot. So in this case, for example, uh, lots B and C were both won by um, the second player there uh, because of the way that they bid. Um, and in this case, $7. I, you'll see $7 was allocated by all four of the players, but depending on how they did it, um, you know, it's in this case, uh, that player guessed better. So you could put all your money in one if that's the one that you really want. Um, this is typically used with sealed bid. There's a, there's a very high level of trying to outguess your opponents with this type of a mechanic. Um, and there's a bunch of games that use this. Um, Shogun, uh, the old uh, Milton Bradley game, uh, uses this. Uh, Revolution from Steve Jackson Games um, is basically just this over and over again, where there's, there's like 12 different spaces behind your screen that you're playing onto. Um, and in the recently released Rising Sun, Eric Lang's game, um, when you're doing a battle, you split your resources between different spots on the board, uh, whether you want to do seppuku or and take control or, or the different types of things that you want to do. Um, so there can be a, a, this can be a very interesting way. And again, you're speeding up the auction because you're, you're auctioning off a bunch of stuff all at one time. Uh, this is another, this is sort of a meta mechanic. Um, and I'm not familiar with that many games that do this, but I, I think it's really interesting. Uh, the idea here is that you can do any type of an auction but the winner of the auction pays their bid divided up between all the other players. Um, I hate to keep going back to the Knitzi well on this, but the uh, the biggest one for this is uh, 
Dream Factory was released in English, which is about uh, making movies. And there's, um, what is it, contracts, I think, is actually the unit of currency. So you bid contracts for, for, for stars or whatever. Uh, and if I bid 12, I'm, I'm the winner then, and there's three, you know, three other players that didn't win, they each get four contracts. So there's like an ebb and flow of the money that moves around. So even if you lose an auction, you're in a better position later to, uh, to take advantage of it. Um, it does, so if you, you spend all your money on a bid, you, you have to wait a couple of turns to come back in. Yes, Mr. Lehman. Another thing that doesn't buy the go up. Okay. Okay. Um, and uh, I haven't played that in years. I should go back and do that. Uh, and the other thing you need to do with it's usually there's a remainder rule. So if there's if you can't divide it evenly, stuff stays in the table for the next winner uh, th that it gets divided up again. So that adds some interesting kind of texture to it. I think Magic Sun also does that. When you lose the battle, a little so bit, you yeah. Take all that money that the person bid with. Right. The loser gets all that. Money. Right, but the loser also loses their money. So the loser loses the money they bid, but they get the money from the winner. So yeah, that's a variation of that too. That's a good point. Okay. Boomtown. Okay. Okay. I should be taking notes on all this. This is all good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I'll watch the video. Um, what was that? Ra, yeah. Except it's the same markers that are going around. Doesn't get divided up evenly, but it's it's a similar sort of concept. Okay. Next up is the reverse auction. I'm actually doing pretty good here. Um, the reverse auction is uh, used for things you don't want to win, which is also in Boomtown. Okay. <laughs> That's this just under, underscores the fact that I need to play Boomtown. <laughs> um, so there's a couple of different methods that can, be, that can be used for this, but the idea is that you're basically bidding to avoid taking the object of whatever it is. And the first person to pass gets it. Um, and what happens at that point um, can, can vary. Typically what happens is the money that people bid, that, did, that uh, uh, it goes away they lose their money. And the person that decided to take the bad object doesn't have to spend any of the money that they bid. They get all their money back. So in exchange, they get that thing back. Um, there are some variations on it, but that's the main one that it works. So in this case, the $4 bidder comes back to him, decides to pass, takes the bad card, um, then the other bidders would have to bid 6 9 and 10 um, So a couple of things um, that this, this actually adds a lot of tension to a bid, can make it really interesting. Um, yeah, this is, it can be a lot of screwage and moaning and groaning as people bid and decide to go up. Um, but um, uh, it also adds, adds a lot of Yomi, but the, uh, it, it can be very turn-oriented in terms of the exact turn order. The first person to bid on it, you know, maybe can have an advantage on it because uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go around before it comes back to them. Um, so high society does this. Um, uh, uh, no thanks does this. And the key part of this is, is, is the, the variation of the value to different players. So it's like high society, for those who haven't played it, again, shame on you, but it's, um, you're, you're bidding to win these value cards and you, you earn objects. So they, they range from one to 10 in value. And the thief card, when the thief card comes up, the person who gets the thief card has to lose one of the objects that they previously had from, from one to 10. So if all you have is a 10, and you get the thief, it's really bad. If you've got a one and a five and you get the thief, well, you can just lose the one. It doesn't impact you as badly. So you have an incentive to take it, doesn't, you know, whereas if you've got the 10, you don't want to take it under any circumstances. So then you start getting into the game of how far can I push this as the player with the one, I'm probably going to end up taking it, but how high can I push it? How much can I push the other players before I'm going to get it? Um, and as I push it, I'm risking that money. So maybe, you know, maybe I didn't really want to pay $6 to not get it because it's, uh, I'm only losing my one, but I wanted to try to push the other players, but I miscalculated. And so I end up losing six. Um, no thanks. Um, and I forget the designer on that. Um, but what was that? What was, oh, Gimler. Yeah. Which is a, which is a terrific game. It's there's there's a few games that I'm like actively angry that I did not design, and No Thanks is one of them. Um, so No Thanks, you're basically either when a card comes up, you either take it or you put one of your chips on it. 
if you're out of chips, you have to take it, but you get all the chips that are on it. So it's kind of like an auction not to take it. Um, and the points of the card are, is just the value of the card, but you're trying not to take points is bad. So if you take the 17 card, it's worth 17 points. But the, the trick is that if you get a run of cards, the value is basically zero. So if I have the 15, the 16, and the 17, that's only, all three of those cards together are only 15 points, or only 17 points, I forget which. But the point is, if I have 15 and 17, 16 is a really good card for me to bet. So, and, and the other players are going to get 16 points for it for me, for them. But for me, it's negative 15 points, basically. So the question becomes, how far can you push it before you take it? Um, and that can add to some incredibly interesting dynamics. So this can be a really, you know, I, I find this type of auction really gives players agita, which I like to do in my games. Um, so I would, I would suggest looking at that. Okay, um, dexterity auctions. I'm only aware of one, I'm probably going to be corrected here, I'm only aware of one game that basically does this. So um, I'm going to just talk about Going, Going, Gone here um, from uh, Scott Nicholson. Um, so the idea in Going, Going, Gone is that there are these cups and there's lots of cards that you're bidding on that are placed next to the cups. And um, you have a bunch of chips, and you basically just, the, the auctioneer, who does not bid in this case, just counts down 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, at a steady cadence, and then puts a giant paddle over all the cups so nobody can put anything in. And during that 10 seconds, or 10 whatevers, you're putting your chips in the different cups. And you can watch what other people are doing. You can wait till the very end and try to throw some in and snipe. It adds a lot of really interesting dynamics to it. It's totally asynchronous. There is a little physical activity to it, but it's not really skill-based, but you have to kind of know in advance of the value that you potentially want to do and keep track of what other people have thrown in the cup. So it can be a really interesting idea for an auction. Yeah, it's fun. Um, okay, fixed placement auctions. Um, so this is, um, there's a bunch of, uh, of different games that do this. Um, not happy with the fixed placement auctions. So in this case, there's usually a series of lots that are up for sale. And then each player has a marker, sometimes more than one marker, that they put onto one of these very specific spots. I just use Fibonacci numbers on this example here. Um, but as an example, this is a Vegas Showdown. Um, so you're bidding on these rooms, and there's a track here. So when you go onto a track, you have to go higher than somebody else that's already on a track. And if you go higher than them, they get kicked off, and they have to go on to another track or go higher than you on the same track. And the auction keeps going around the table with people placing markers or sometimes you get kicked off, you get priority, and then they, um, until everybody is on a track by themselves. Um, so this has some interesting interplay again of trying to push people up. Um, you can go on to any number on the track. It's, it's a constrained bid so it does speed things up and you're auctioning off multiple things all at the same time. Um, the games that use this are Amon Ray, does this uh, Vegas showdown, and uh, Cyclades also does this type of auction. Yeah, okay. I'm going to zip through some of these last ones. You're getting me the eye here. Okay. So Dutch priority, um, this is primarily used into Spikerstadt or Jordan, uh which was the rework re re version of that. Same idea where you have multiple lots, but players put pawns against each one, and the amount that you then have to pay when everyone puts all their pawns down then you go lot by lot. So in this case, we'd say, okay, for lot W, player A, if you want it, you have to pay $5. If player A says no, they take their marker off, and then we go to player C, and we say, okay, player C, you would now have to pay $4. Do you want it? Okay? And you just, so if you see somebody goes on to this spot earlier, the first spot, then you can pile behind them just to force them to pay more for it, even if you don't want, or you could put your own marker behind yours. There's a lot of interesting gamey mechanics that come out of this. Um, I, I think the Spikerstadt is a woefully underrated game. I think this auction mechanic is really terrific, and I would love to see it used in other games. You have like three, usually three pawns, yeah, three or four pawns. That's what it looks like in the actual game. Um, okay. Yeah, the Dutch of all kinds of things. Okay, so again, these are the auction types that we went through here. So, you know, open English. So, the idea is that, you know, I, I like to, that's why I love to read lots of rules, is to expose people to different types of um, mechanics and, you know, to get all these, you, you see, even for, for all the number of games I've been playing for all the years I've been playing, you know, there's, there's all these other games and things that have. So the idea is by just compiling all of these different options, you know, okay, I'm interested in an auction mechanic, 
you can flip through a bunch of different things and just start to get some ideas and get some feeling for other things. So I hope that this type of format is useful for people. And um, I will leave it open for a couple of questions. Or Oh, you have a question. I, I, I have a, I Oh, have I a thought you were just telling me to stop no. talking. No, no, no. Um, <laughs> just, just a quick one. This, uh, there's a professor I had it, 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 in college. He auctioned off a dollar. But the, the top two bids had to pay. Right. Yes. And it never stopped. Yes, yes, that's that's a dollar auction that's really famous. I almost included that in here, but I'm not actually aware of any board game that uses it's not, that. Yeah, it's, a, it's an yeah, game. it's kind of a trap. The, yeah. the the key thing is just never to start bidding uh, in that one. So yeah, are there any other questions? I know we're a little late. Um, I guess you can probably come up to the mic. We might as well do it. We haven't been doing it yet. If you want to come up uh, while you're coming up, I will actually say that this, my favorite thing about Despiker Shot. As a game is that the English version of it, the title is The Spikerstadt. <laughs> <laughs> just, just a quick addition to uh, the uh, sealed bid is the sealed bid where everybody loses their money. And, uh, I played a couple of games like that, and I, once again, I can't remember their names. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, sealed bids. Yeah. Oh. So it is a, sort of a variation of sealed bid is that it's a lot of sealed bids, only the winner loses there, but yeah, there are definitely some where everybody loses them. Which I don't like, because I mean, I like to give my players angst, but I think that's a little bit too much. <laughs> uh, a, a kind of auction that I'm always, I, I read about every once in a while online, and I'm always curious if it's made it into games, if you know of any games that have it, or if not, why? Is it a uniform price auction, where you bid both a price and a quantity that you want out of a full pool, and then you, once you've satisfied everybody, you start with the, the highest bidder, satisfy their buy all the way down to the cheapest, and then everyone pays... For right. your lot based on the cheapest price. Right, I'm right. curious if you've ever seen that in a game. Yeah, or... there are some economics game one. I think that there's a chocolate game. Yeah. Choco. Choco and Company, which does that kind of. Oh, yeah. Cool. Um, where it's, it yeah, I never thought of that as an auction, but you're right. That is kind of an auction. So there's a certain number of lots that go for sale and people fulfilling. There's, kind, you know, that there's a certain number, they'll take it a certain quantity. Yeah. And so if you, you fill first, but you fill a larger quantity, lower price, but other people could do smaller quantities at higher prices. So, yeah, that's, that's a way of doing that as well. Yeah, what's that called? Shaco and Company, S-C-H-O-K-O. -O. Got it. There's a lot of other issues with that game, though. <laughs> so, but that auction is cool. <laughs> Chocolate theme is fun. How would you categorize the auction used in Tom's 1846? It has a system where you, you pull cards out, you pick one card, some of them are blanks, and basically, you're taking turns, taking cards out. With that, more of a draft, more of a draft than an auction. Between feels like an auction. I yeah, know. I mean, auctions. You know, auctions are one of those things that can polymorph into a lot of different types of mechanics. I mean, it's like saying, like in a racing game, that that's the same as victory points, right? You get a victory point for every space you go around a Formula Day track, and when you get to 140 points, you win, right? So there's a lot of polymorphisms between different things, like the tracks, like drafting tracks to Dutch auctions. So, yeah, there's, there's a lot of equivalencies to that. They do that now in NASCAR where they have stage races. You know, oh, really? They, yeah, they okay. Buy, they buy the races into three stages. Uh -huh. And then stages one and two, top ten goes ten down to one. And then at the end you get, uh, you know, the final, I think it's one, and then points for the entire race. Okay, cool. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. So. Um, on, on that, actually, um, I was wondering if the um, the tile pulling the tile from the bag in Zularetto and putting on the carts is it would that be a selection order bid? Auction? It's kind of a yeah. I mean, it's kind of um, it, it's almost like a reverse auction. It's kind of more of a poison pill sort of a thing where you're trying to build up sets that other people might not want or whatever. So right. or taking it. So yeah, it's kind of an auction where the players are building the lots and auctioning things off as they go. So I would say it's sort of a hybrid that fits into that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thanks all. Uh, I'll be around. I was thinking of society. Okay.